Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Let's see, I'll be doing both ways here. Uh, so I'm going to share the screen here. <clears throat> this is wicked cool. All right. Just one other thing we do. Oops. Let's make myself disappear. Okay, great. So, hi. Um, so I could have up front, and if it's somebody, I hear some some noises. If you're on Zoom, if you could mute, that'd be great. Uh, I'd like to state up front that I'm I'm here to advocate for the uh, uses of of architecture and design, um, and all the folks who shape the built environment um, in the grand project of gradually but decisively transforming the um, or retrofitting the unsustainable, inequitable, inefficient, and increasingly obsolete aspects of, of suburbia in, in Northern America. So uh, places like this uh, can be this, or alternately uh, this. We need both compact redevelopment and regreening projects. Uh, so my message for you is that suburban built form can and urgently must uh, be retrofitted for better health, uh, increased social equity and resilience in the, the face of climate change. And that many more architects, landscape architects, urban planners, developers, uh, and other stewards of the built environment should be taking up the challenges. Uh, and that there is a lot of uh, latent opportunity in already urbanized places, uh, particularly um, in the commercial in the commercial landscapes um, in the continent. So, I've been um, researching the topic of retrofitting suburbia for over twenty years now, um, on my own, and in collaboration with Ellen Dunham Jones of, of Georgia Tech. Uh, and the most recent uh, volume uh, in our series of publications came out last year, titled Case Studies in Retrofitting Suburbia. So the talk I'm giving you today is, is going to be primarily um, from, this, from this latest book. So uh, after careful study of the, the deep and rich history of suburbanization, uh, the ideals and de design visions, I have another book that, that covers that, um, the politics and, and policies, um, the economic and, and social forces, um, as well as the collection of many, many case study examples. We have over 2,000 that we're, we're tracking um, now. Um, we proposed a framework about how processes of retrofitting individual uh, suburban form sites, that is um, pieces of that actual property may add up over time incrementally towards uh, real change. So we call this incremental metropolitanism and uh, suburban retrofitting then is, as we see it, a 50 year project um, for re remaking the metropolis into a more sustainable and resilient multi-centered urban structure uh, through systemic transformation of large prototypical uh, single use suburban sites um, and by large, that could mean a few acres to you know hundreds of acres uh, uh, beyond kind of the the idea of the urban lot, right? Uh, including vacant and obsolete shopping malls, big boxes, and and office parks. Uh, and I'd say we're we're maybe a, a, well more than a decade into it, uh, and hopefully we can make some real change over the next generation. Um, so in the new book, we argue that there are six urgent challenges for raising the bar on the next generation of suburban retrofits. And today in this talk, I'm gonna talk about um, and illustrate three of them. So improving public health, leveraging social capital for equity and adding water and energy resilience. <laughs> uh, to set the context, I'll start with a quote from leading. Yes. Sorry, I wonder if someone minimized the. What have we got back there? Oh, yes. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. 
Let's see. Yeah, I did it on my own screen. Yeah. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Sorry about that. I didn't look back. I did the same thing on my screen. <laughs> I didn't want to see my own face uh, while I'm talking. Okay. So I appreciate that. Um, so, quote, uh, America's history of racial exclusion repeats and deepens itself as low-income people of color are displaced from newly sheep neighborhoods, shut out of all but the lowest wage jobs, and isolated in aging, disinvested communities these days in the suburbs. So recognition is, is finally gaining that suburbs are not um, physically homogenous, uh, nor are suburbanites all the same in terms of socioeconomics, race, or ethnicity. So we're getting past some of these really persistent uh, stereotypes. Um, however, the built environment within metropolitan regions remains highly fragmented and in many cases um, segregated. Uh, and it's been systemically structured uh, to be that way over many growth cycles. Um, and the barriers to decreasing segregation and inequity the uh, stubbornly persist. Uh, the number of suburban census tracts with high levels of poverty um, has grown. Uh, and yet while poor places get poorer, many rich places get richer and the uneven playing field um, has become more inequitable. Uh, and here you see data showing the increasing concentration of US wealth in the top 1% of the population uh, since the 19. 80s. So that's kind of, you know, that's the, the context. Uh, and couple this with uh, data about retail square footage per capita in the countries of Northern America, uh, most specifically the US and Canada. And I was recently just a couple of weeks ago gave, giving a series of presentations in, in Australia, which is, you know, really uh, doing well in, in third place here. Uh, so we see both cause for alarm, but also potentially optimism uh, here. This excess of already developed and disturbed land area within our metropolitan regions um, spells opportunity to salvage the future of, of suburban areas through through retrofitting. And we're talking, you know, many square miles of of area uh, in these kinds of developments. Uh, so the first challenge I'd like to introduce today is to improve public health. Uh, the pandemic has, of course, highlighted how already vulnerable people are more susceptible. Uh, public health researchers have a wealth of documentation about how sedentary lifestyles associated with suburban form produce heightened risk of obesity and chronic disease, of dying in car crashes, and of developing crippling addictions. And these are sort of the leading causes of, of disease and, and death in, in our part of the world. Um, but modest amounts of, of physical activity um, encouraged and supported by how places are replanned and rebuilt uh, are low, low cost um, cure. So by how we retrofit, we can make places healthier, safer, and we can improve human welfare. So this example is a just a small pilot project um, that sought to implement this research linking design to increased uh, levels of healthy phys physical activity. And I think there's area here um, to get some funding as well when these things are, are linked. Um, so this is a, a two block long retrofitted street that's also more complete, um, accommodating pedestrians, as you can see with the uh, the man jogging with his with his uh, furry friend, um, and the redesign also incorporates soft green infrastructure to manage the stormwater, um, which you can see in the foreground with how the the curbs are, are detailed. And increasingly, these kinds of modifications are becoming the norm and the and the standard. But really, there are just many many miles of streets and and in our suburban areas that have not yet had these improvements. Uh, and this example uh, literally addresses uh, disrupting auto dependence um, as well as public health issues. So I'm not really going in depth on, 
uh, the, the urgent challenge to disrupt auto dependence. But in the case study examples we collect, that's almost like a, a prerequisite to, to some extent. Um, so this is a figure field sequence. And in our case studies, our in-depth case studies, this is the technique that we, we use to look back in time to the present and then project um, into the future. Um, and so in these diagrams, um, you see uh, this site in Somerville, Massachusetts, outside Boston. Um, from the left is, uh, it was a, a Ford Motors Motor Vehicles assembly plant that provided many, many jobs. So you had these sort of working class um, residential neighborhoods just adjacent where people could, you know, work, walk to their, their jobs in the, in the factory for, for decades. Um, then it was converted to an auto oriented uh, shopping mall uh, surrounded by big box retail after the construction of the interstate highway I-91 that, um, I-93, sorry, that, that cut off the neighborhoods from, from this, this um, set of properties. Um, and now on the right, we see an emergent, much higher density mixed use neighborhood. And uh, so instead of a sea of asphalt and, and big box stores, and, and actually the originally planned uh, redevelopment for the site was a single Ikea store. So that was blocked and stopped. The Ikea went elsewhere, but not in this key um, location. Uh, so Assembly Square is now walkable and bikeable um, with waterfront access. So there's a, a river there uh, that many residents didn't even know existed in their community. Um, and there's more than a million square feet of new office space, much of it um, medical, medical use. And let's see, I'll go back to this one. Um, so the, the new orange line stop two that you see in the foreground um, was the first new transit station in decades um, added to the Boston T system. So Boston, like New York, invested in mass transit kind of in the 19th century and then kind of let it stagnant, become stagnant. Uh, so the line was there already, but there was no reason to have a stop there because there was nothing, nothing to do. Um, and so this was an opportunity then to actually expand the system inward, right, by um, adding a stop where it, where it already um, passed by. Uh, and the left, you just see the great Albert Kahn, the architect for Ford, these butterfly roofs, and that building still exists. It's got Christmas tree shops in it now, which I think, yeah, you can see that's the parking for the that reused building on the right, and then all the new development coming in um, adjacent uh, to it. And the key idea here of the local community activist group, uh, which called themselves the Mystic View Task Force, uh, sort of signaling that idea that you could have a view of the Mystic River <laughs> if you could get to it, um, was a demand that uh, Assembly Square live up to its name, um, sort of the 21st century, by becoming a place where people could actually assemble together rather than a place where cars were, were assembled. Uh, it's not great getting underneath I-93 here. <laughs> uh, and 93 is actually, if you've heard of the big dig in Boston. So as it goes into Boston, then it goes underground, but it comes back out again uh, north of the city. And, and so it's elevated here in, in Somerville. Uh, the second urgent challenge uh, I want to talk about is to leverage social capital for equity. Uh, so within the context of, of suburban retrofitting, um, social capital is the introduction or um, enhancement of social infrastructure within a project. Um, simply put, a strengthened social infrastructure increases urban resilience. Um, that is the capacity of a place with its inhabitants to survive, adapt, and even grow in the face of both chronic um, and acute stresses and, and shocks, be they economic, uh, climactic, political, or kind of all three at, at once. Um, so how can retrofits address this challenge in ways that increase resilience? Um, we propose that there are three basic strategies uh, that can be mixed and matched. Uh, so the flourishing of locally owned uh, businesses can be supported by re-inhabitation retrofits of uh, already existing commercial spaces. So this is adaptive reuse, um, basically, um, often in 
ethnoburbs. Are you, are you familiar with that term, ethnoburbs? Um, so there's been a lot of research looking at demographics and understanding that um, increasingly suburban areas are the gateway entry points for immigrant groups. Um, and so the ethnoburb might be a concentration of folks from recent decades, um, Asia or, or Latin America or also Africa that then come and, and they don't go to a center city first and then to the suburbs in the next generation, they go straight to, um, they have been going straight to, to suburban areas. Um, so that's the re-inhabitation retrofits can help with, with those businesses that often involve um, um, small loans within the community rather than working through kind of, you know, mainstream uh, banks and, and so forth. Uh, redevelopment retrofits can add and preserve jobs, um, housing affordability and choice. So redevelopment might involve, you know, demolishing some, some buildings or building on the parking lots with, with new structures. Uh, and then regreening retrofits uh, can provide equitable access to an enhanced civic realm of public and shared green spaces and help assert to a right to the suburb. So that's one of the shifts is that um, suburban development, the ideals were predicated on having more private outdoor space. And so you wouldn't need the, the civic square and the, and the public parks, right? So how do we get that back as a way for people to um, congregate um, with one another and also you know, have a, a, just even at the most basic level, have a right to be in, in space, right? On a sidewalk or, or what have you. Um, so, and of course, uh, these strategies can and should be uh, employed both in suburbanized communities with high rates of poverty, uh, where need um, is right, but also in more prosperous places with greater access to opportunity. So those should be opened up to, to, more, um, to more people. And I'm going to share uh, three urban design approaches that implement these strategies. Uh, so first, um, revisiting the sociological concept of the third place um, introduced and popularized by Ray Oldenburg uh, in the 1970s. We have some familiarity with the third place theory, yeah. So a third place is not home and it's not work. Instead, it's an informal gathering place where um, people regularly go to socialize in convivial company. And I think this is something that we understand it's become more acute in the work from home paradigm where those two other um, places have become smooshed together and the need to have some third other place uh, becomes more, I think, apparent. Um, so people love to meet and socialize in outdoor public squares, uh, gardens, playgrounds, or um, as shown here, perhaps in an art installation that transformed a a vacant gas station in uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. So um, countless small uh, grocery anchored strip shopping centers um, have the potential to be consciously reshaped into third place neighborhood sites. And you know, there's a lot written about dead malls, like these big malls, but there are just thousands and thousands of these smaller um, strip centers distributed kind of everywhere. Um, so they can be consciously reshaped uh, into third place neighborhood anchors, if that's something that seems desirable or needed in the, in the context with the addition of covered seating, uh, breezeways, uh, decent coffee and, and food. Um, so become less you know, convenience oriented and more uh, of, a, of a locus or a node um, itself. And that involves then management policies that tolerate some degree of purposeful loitering um, Public buildings are also suitable, um, such as branch libraries and recreation centers. And we have case study examples of big box stores being turned into those more community oriented um, uses. So here are the owners of uh, Lake Grove Village um, near Portland, Oregon, uh, removed and recycled uh, part of the original grocery anchored strip mall to create covered passageways. And I think you can see that here. They basically took two of the inline stores out Right, so maybe you're losing, you know, rentable space there, but it enhances the value of the remaining square footage and uh, 
then they put these overhangs over it and, and more seating. It also opens up to the rear of the property so people can get some more parking spaces there and also make it easier for people in the neighboring areas to walk or bike um, to the center without having to get on the kind of the main road. Um, so it's got these kind of hangout places. Um, ethnic shopping centers are central to the lives of immigrant uh, suburbanites who go to them to shop for specialized things um, and to forge bonds with, with others uh, in their culture. So um, many of these are re-inhabitation of older malls, um, retrofitted with new tenants, um, comprising often certainly a much higher percentage of, of independent retailers. Um, so this is an example. This is in Fort Worth. Um, what had originally been built as the Seminary South Shopping Center on a filled wetland uh, by the development arm of Sears Corporation. So, you know, hitting all those marks uh, there. Um, it's now, its most recent incarnation is as a highly successful Hispanic themed uh, mall um, called La Grand Plaza de Fort Worth. Uh, with one of the anchor stores has been converted into a 120,000 square foot three level Mercado. So instead of a you know, single Sears, it has hundreds of little booths in it um, for little businesses that are all kind of attached to um, you know, where people do remittances or, or other things. Uh, and then they host uh, such examples as Mexican wrestling in the, in the uh, atrium uh, space and often huge festivals and political rallies in the parking lot. So if you're running for elected office, this is where you meet. This is where you meet the people, right? Um, at the Mosaic District, uh, this is in, in Virginia near Washington, D.C., um, a dead multiplex cinema site, you can see on the upper right here, uh, was redeveloped into a compact uh, mixed-use development near transit, so it's close to a, a stop on the DC Metro system, uh, with particular attention here paid to combating um, the epidemic of loneliness uh, by programming the civic park that you see here. Um, and actually, I think that might be us for but uh, uh, programming it with highly, um, with lots of activities and really um, activating the, the ground floor. So you see on the bottom left, this is our diagram of the, the three-story, um, well, the four-level target. So the actual big box is up on the top level above parking, and then the first level of that building is, is lined with, with small shops. So it's a different way to organize the same thing. It's still a target. Uh, okay. And then... Uh, a second uh, tactic um, is to provide more housing types and choices, uh, including units for rent. And we get a lot of blowback sometimes when we're talking to, to certain kinds of audiences, like people want those big houses and, and the big houses stay <laughs> for the most part. And the idea, though, is to complement them and supplement them with different choices for the people who don't want that. We've got a large supply of, of that and it's locked in because of subdivisions and individual ownerships. That's pretty hard to, to change. But within communities that are largely built out that way, you can use these commercial properties to, to add other types of, of housing. Um, and past recessions, on the one we might be going into now, um, have exposed the risk of over-reliance on a single suburban uh, housing product. Um, and we have to recognize that detached houses and subdivisions are seen of as and described as as products, right? Um, comprised of, of detached houses that vary only in, in dwelling size and, and price point. Um, so missing middle housing types, uh, duplexes, fourplexes, cottage courts, et cetera, are a way to incrementally introduce more uh, choice into housing monocultures. And there's a growing you know, discussion here. And again, the pushback from suburban communities is if we wanted you know, tall apartment buildings, we wouldn't live here. There's a lot in between a, a multi-story 
200 unit apartment building in a detached house, right? There's a whole lot. And design is plays a, a key role in demonstrating that not all density looks the same. Um, in this example, the, uh, the master development um, agreement for the Wyandanche rising retrofit in a highly um, distressed area of Long Island included a labor agreement uh, for all subcontractors to hire first from a pool of local residents that were um, trained through a community center on the site. Uh, so one of these is pictured here. Uh, she was a mother of three uh, living in a shelter when she applied for training um, to become a carpenter. She excelled, became a working member of the union, and actually now she runs that community center on, on site. So that's a success story. Um, Wine Dance Rising is a in an historically black uh, unincorporated hamlet in, in Suffolk County. And there's a whole interesting story uh, about how that came to be um, in the post-World War II period. Um, this is an ambitious retrofit, many years, um, decades in the making, really. Uh, and you see here lots of highly affordable um, new apartments around a civic green. And my understanding is these are like two, three bedroom apartments. Many of the residents are, are um, woman-led households with, with children. Uh, and um, the Civic Green, it's all built on cleaned up brown fields and, and gray fields. So it's parking lots for the, the commuting, um, the commuter rail station that had been pre-existing here, but with little used. Um, it was a form-based code that uh, put in place at the by the, the town of Babylon. So this is an unincorporated hamlet within the much larger town of, of uh, Babylon in, in Suffolk County. Um, so they also didn't have local representation from being unincorporated versus other um, villages and hamlets that, that have mayors and so forth along that um, So a lot of effort then had to go into creating this um, network of trust with dozens of, of civic and religious groups. So this is just a map. Each green um, square represents one of those groups. Many of them are faith-based um, communities that were brought into these, these discussions um, because there was a great deal of fear about displacement right, um, through this project. Mm. So uh, the town also commissioned um, landscape architect Olin um, studio out of Philadelphia to design a, a one acre green at the center. Um, and you can see an image of it in the middle when it converts to an ice skating rink. Um, this was actually uh, uh, Ellen's um, spouse is a photographer, Philip Jones, and he was there on the day it opened. Um, so you can see the, the kids skating. Uh, and then on the right, you see the, the colorful grand public stair uh, for the commuter parking garage. So the first piece that went in was a multi-level parking garage in order to free up all the acreage that had been used for, for surface parking. And um, this was actually designed by Jeff Speck, if you've heard of him, um, the sort of guru for, for walkable city, uh, the author of the book. But he he um, he designed the stair tower, the idea being that if it's really attractive and well lit, people might walk up the stairs rather than, than take the the elevator so that you know keys into the physical activity and the, the better health um, side of this. Uh, and then also in the realm of, of adding more kind of missing middle housing types, um, this is an example in Rhode Island uh, called uh, the Cottages on Green. Um, and so this is a former car repair shop and there's I guess CVS on one end and then detached houses on the on the other side. And in the middle, the architects showed, you know, what 15 units might look like in a double loaded corridor apartment building. And that would be very out of character potentially, but this for the neighbors, but the same uh, density, the same number of units could be accommodated in a cottage court where every unit has a front door. Uh, when you're walk walking or driving along the street, you see what appears to be detached houses, but then you kind of turn in and there's sort of cluster more of them behind. So again, demonstrating that the, the configuration of the density uh, matters a lot. Um, and then there's a shared green here that you see in the, in the center. Uh, and these were 
um, 30% of income qualified units uh, here. So a third uh, approach or tactic is um, uh, to leverage suburban social capital um, to promote inequity and justice involves redressing the, the public or civil realm, um, which as I already noted is often an impoverished aspect of conventional suburban form. Uh, so French theorist Henri Lefebvre's uh, concept of the, the right to the city, uh, which was birthed in the social upheavals of European cities in the 1960s, um, has been reframed by some scholars as uh, the right to the, the suburb. Um, in recognition of a need to theorize areas in the urban periphery where, after all, um, most people live. Uh, so um, a suburban public realm can be co-created through retrofits that insist that places that look public um, in form, in that they have sidewalks, street trees and such, um, should afford real rights to, to all people. Um, and this, I think, becomes increasingly uh, pressing when developers are, are seeking to integrate into their projects the look of traditional urbanism, right? But they may not actually be making it open in, in the same way. So that's something that I certainly advocate for. Uh, so in, in New York, uh, which is my home, uh, I'm just here for the semester as a visitor, which I'm enjoying uh, immensely. Um, so New York is a city not typically associated with suburban form. Uh, however, a lot of New York City actually is suburban in, in form when you get outside of Manhattan and, and Brownstone, Brooklyn, and, and you know some parts of, uh, uh, of the Bronx. Um, this is a failed car-oriented uh, strip shopping center. Um, on the edge of Queens, uh, which is being replaced with hundreds of sorely needed, uh, deeply affordable housing uh, units. And I've, I've circled here in red, uh, kind of the entry to the project on, on Ma Avenue and right across from it, that little white circle is the, the terminus of the A train. So the Southern terminus of the, the subway. And uh, this site actually then with this new spine coming through, could connect from the terminus of the A train of the New York City subway to a terminus of one of the Long Island Railroad um, routes. So it kind of connects the, the two. Uh, okay, I think I have time. Uh, the third uh, urgent challenge is to add water and energy resilience. So, 20th century suburban form was based largely on an industrial model of segregation and optimized uh, engineering of separated systems um, rather than interdependency. Uh, so for example, uh, countless wetlands filled, creeks channeled um, into concrete culverts to prepare large parcels for commercial development, to put in the interstate highway, et cetera. Um, and then, new residential subdivisions expanded into, um, into wildfire zones um, and, and so forth. Um, with the idea that we could use technology and engineering to overcome those environmental or transform those, those environmental um, conditions. Um, I think there's now much greater recognition of the collateral damage uh, such systems have wrought. Uh, on our environment over decades cumulatively and, and how climate change is increasing risks of extreme weather, flooding, droughts, wildfires, urban heat island effects, you know, all of it. And I know it's happening right here, clearly in, in Arizona. Um, however, upgrading the performance of already existing uh, suburban water and energy systems is, is really hard. Um, so this is where retrofits can come, come in. They can certainly contribute uh, to this. And, and again, there are many who are talking about how to build entirely new communities that are you know, optimized in this way. And that's fine, but to some degree, rather than building something totally new, how can we redirect growth back into these already disturbed places? I think that's kind of the, the bigger message and it's harder to do, but it's more important, I think, broadly and cumulatively to, to do that. 
Uh, so, um, we can mitigate though, just again, those three kind of broad ideas of retrofitting as redeveloping, re-inhabiting or, or re-greening uh, come into place here as well. So we can redevelop suburban form uh, with walkable transit serve compact urban form. Uh, where it's more suitable, we can re-inhabit um, or reuse existing buildings to retain embodied energy and maybe do both. So the lots of examples of infilling the parking lots around an existing building, right? So we can do both. Um, and then further, we can introduce green soft infrastructure in place of gray hard infrastructure uh, to manage stormwater, reduce overall energy use, and integrate renewable um, energy sources. So, you know, can't get into all of these examples, but there's a whole menu of things. And the broader idea is that there is a, a will and often regulations to do these in, in the dense center cities, but somehow they fall off the plate. In, in suburbanized context. And, and I think it's really important to insist that they are there. Uh, let's see, so I've got three urban design approaches. I'll just quickly cover and then we'll wrap up. So uh, retrofitting water for resilience where there's too much water. Uh, so suburban form tends to exacerbate problems of both water quality and quantity. Um, stormwater runoff, uh, becomes excessive and degraded. And again, it's not just local. It like has it impacts the whole the whole region when this happens um, with oil, salts, fertilizers, and so on. And about a tenth of all uh, occupied US housing units are in floodplains. So one in ten. Uh, half of those built since 1980. Okay. So this is a real problem across metropolitan Houston. Um, and this is Exploration Green, uh, where volunteers are leading the conversion of a defunct 180-acre golf course. Golf courses are not good for water infiltration, right? Um, so converting it into a linear nature park featuring stormwater detention ponds, like a linked series of detention ponds that will um, help protect thousands of, of nearby households. Uh, and then here in the downtown of uh, working class Meriden in Connecticut, uh, a creek was culverted decades ago uh, into concrete underground tubes uh, and the hub mall. So this was a, an urban renewal era project uh, and the mall, the mall called the hub mall was built over it. Um, the site flooded frequently and devastatingly uh, as seen here in a, Ninth, on the lower left, there's a 1992 uh, news photo of that parking lot. Um, so eventually it was all demolished. Uh, the creek was daylit, so it was restored in this area. Uh, and the whole site was regraded, so it was lowered to become a, a, a basin and regreened as a stormwater park um, to be surrounded by new affordable apartments on higher ground. And you can see here, these are our diagrams. Yellow, that was um, public housing, which was flooded as well. So uh, that was demolished. Those folks were rehoused um, and there's new apartments being built uh, on higher ground. There's also a, a new train station um, that's gone in place here. Uh, and then that bridge that you can see actually is the, the high water mark of, of floods. So when there is a flooding event and, and last summer um, or summer 2021, tropical storm Elsa kind of filled this whole thing up as like a bathtub as it was meant, meant to do. Uh, and then retrofitting water for resilience where there's too little water. And this, you're very familiar here, probably, you know, I'm learning more about this, but um, increasing shade, evaporative cooling, uh, uh, trees, bioswales, low, um, high albedo coatings, um, and so forth. It's important. Um, and these do add up, I would say. And then paired with depaving to just reduce those um, impermeable uh, surfaces. Um, and then retrofitting for energy resilient uh, by uh, implementing district energy systems and neighborhood scale and retrofits and generating renewable energy at the project uh, scale. So 
solar panels, wind turbines, geothermal um, wells. And this is an example. I'll just quickly show it was a trucking facility all paved and now it's this park with geothermal wells underneath and a lot of programming, a lot of civic programming. Uh, those are the before and after diagrams. And then just finally, uh, this is uh, Red Oak Park in Boulder, Colorado, uh, where 1960s era energy inefficient mobile home park uh, was redeveloped to 100 units of deeply affordable solar powered um, missing middle rental units with former residents given priority to, to return. Uh, so these are the six challenges. These are the three I've focused on. We have 32 in-depth case studies in the new book across Northern America. And I just wanted to wrap up here. These are some discussion points. So I hope we still have some time for, yeah, for just discussion. Okay, so I'll just go very, very quickly. I'll just go through these. I won't even say them. I'm just going to leave them up here. And thank you very much. And I'll take questions. On here. Um, the one question that came up was um, how do you think the technology that we were talking about over towards um, places in America? What do you think that can change if um, the truck brings manufacturing back? I think that's a that's a really interesting question because uh, obviously not every um, shopping mall or strip center will be converted to housing or um, you know this live work play kind of developer's ideal uh, and I think a lot of that space actually should be workplaces right and manufacturing there's a lot of clean manufacturing too so the Kind of 19th century idea where industrial uses had to be completely separated from everything else because they were really polluting and noxious doesn't always pertain to to new kinds of um making businesses so so um clean manufacturing small-scale manufacturing uh, in new york city for example most um manufacturing businesses there had like fewer than 10 employees right um even back in the day right uh so small businesses can certainly be part of that re-inhabitation thing where they're actually making stuff and possibly selling it there or selling it elsewhere. So I think that's a huge, a huge area. Um, and then of course, these are already zoned separate. So if, if it's if it's an in you know heavier kind of manufacturing, there are ideal locations for that as well. Uh, totally and people should be able to have that home businesses um right everywhere basically whether they're um it's services they're they're basically is there is the is the work or whether it's making food or some other type of thing as well yeah great quick one question here and then yeah yeah so oh, I was just wondering if you could talk about, um, yeah, you what you mentioned about public private partnerships and the idea of like balancing like public investment to help a developer, right? I'm um, using the benefit of the community, but you know, is that the most fair way to go about kind of you know achieving some of the outcomes that you're talking about? And you know, what what have you learned about how that works? Yeah, I think we need continuously better policies and and um insisting that if a project is going to go to a place that there's protection for people to be able to, to, to stay there and, and so on, especially if it's near transit. I think that's a great publicly invested resource that should should be available to to all. I, I do think that um, uh, part of what needs to be seen in these contexts is that the, the public investment, whether it's through tax increment financing or something else, can help offset the first construction costs of preparing a grayfield site versus a, a greenfield site. And that does need to be leveled off, I think, in, in some way. Uh, a lot of the case studies, we, you know, there's a whole whole um, growing cohort, I think, of uh, committed developers, creative, committed, socially oriented developers who, um, when they're committed to a project and it's the right site, uh, can then work in partnership in very, very positive ways in these projects. 
So let me, yeah, let me just say I'm here for the rest of the semester. Yeah. If anybody wants to find me down on the second floor or contact me via email, I'll meet you for lunch, for coffee, whatever. So uh, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it.